Good afternoon. Today is Sunday, May 1st, 2022. It's about 70 degrees here in downtown Cleveland at 2.30 p.m. See the nice trees that are blooming with the pinkish and whitish colors and the green grass starting to grow. Today we're going to be going to the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. At 3 o'clock p.m. I have a tunnel tour scheduled. I guess they have done this every year for years. But the last time they did it, I believe, was 2019 because of the pandemic. This year they resumed it. I think the tours used to be free, but you had to wait in line. But now, this year they made them, I believe it was $3 per ticket. And they went on sale, I think, at the end of March. And they got snatched up pretty quickly. I was able to get a ticket, though, because I saw it the day they came out. They do have a standby line, too, if you weren't able to get a ticket. I'm not sure how many of those people have been able to get in. But before I go in to see the underground tunnels, let's try to read a little bit of history as I walk around. I'm just pulling this from the internet. It says the Soldiers and Sailors Monument was built in 1894 to commemorate the 9,000 Cuyahoga County soldiers who served in the American Civil War. And then located below the monument, there are tunnels of passageways made of unfinished sandstone. You can see it looks like they probably have the registration desk over there. But when we do see the tunnels, they're supposed to be in the shape of concentric circles that are fully functional, built in the same architectural style as the catacombs of a European cathedral. And then the tunnels themselves, they serve as basement storage, but their true purpose is supposed to act as a support for the monument. And that's, this monument is made of 140 tons of black Quincy granite and the outdoor sanctuary, the statues and the roof weigh another 100 tons. So it's a very heavy monument. So all those tunnels help support it underground. The monument also includes the 125 foot shaft. At the top of the shaft sits a bronze statue of the Goddess of Liberty, which represents loyalty to the United States. So yeah, it should be pretty fun to go check it out at around 3 o'clock p.m. I'm just going to circle around the monument here and then probably stop the video and resume it once it's closer in my time to get inside. Ended up being a beautiful day. It was originally the forecast was calling for scattered thunderstorms between the hours of 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. And they were saying in the email, like, oh, if, it's, if rain is expected, be prepared to wear proper shoes because the tunnels could seep some water into it. But fortunately, the sun is out. It's cloudy a little bit and a little windy, but we look to be in the clear as far as the weather goes. Let me try to get up to the stairway level here so we can get a little bit closer to some of these statues. And we can see the impressive architecture of all this. All the detail. And a nice shot of Terminal Tower in the background. That sunlight's kind of bright, so it may be clouding the picture a bit. I'm 
when we get inside when it's time for our tour. I may not film when the guy or person is giving their speech, but I'll plan on start filming once we're actually beginning the walking part of the tour, like going underground. I'm not sure how well the lighting will be. For all I know, it could be pitch black, so maybe it won't show up on the video. I meant to bring a flashlight in case that happened, but forgot the flashlight. The cell phone phone light is probably not strong enough if it is that dark. I never noticed they have some labels for this. This one says the Advanced Guard. And if you look at the very top, unless you circle around, it's not the easiest to read, but something Wagner, Wilderness maybe. I see something about New Orleans near the top. And it keeps on going up all the way to where it says Liberty. Yeah, looking forward. This is the first time I've ever attempted to do the tunnel tour. So I'm excited to see how involved it is. It's not gonna be too layered. Like it's not gonna go like throughout the city of Cleveland. Probably be just a couple of tunnels, but it will be interesting nonetheless. So what I didn't realize is it looks like there's actually a little door here that takes you to the underground tunnel. I thought we were gonna go inside first, but it looks like we're gonna enter through that little door that's there and that'll take us underground and we'll probably start in the tunnels and make our way back to the actual inside of the monument that has all the names inside of it the part that's usually open during the year all right so we're gonna be trying to duck underneath into the tunnels here you can see a little ramp to get down here So you just came in through the, what we call the rabbit hole. That's a, a half-sized door that was cut in in the 1950s. You'll hear me say the term 1950s quite a bit because they did quite a bit of renovations in the 1950s. Some good, some not so good. One of the things they did that was good was they cut this doorway nice and tall. It's the last comfortable doorway you're going to go. The rest are about four feet tall. You'll have to stoop down. They're about a foot and a half thick. If you get to about a foot and decide to stand up, you'll know it. Uh, we're going to go around the curved wall here. When you get to the end of the curved wall, you're going to make a left to go into that next room. We're going to go down to the picture at the end of the room, line up along the wall, and that's where we're going to stop to have the next conversation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
42 tons of sandstone holding up the statuary. This is our artillery statue on this side. These stones, if you go out there and you pace off the artillery statue, it's a lot smaller than what we're looking at right here. That's because these are extended on either side to hold up this decking. That's also what these archways are here for. That's the reason these tunnels exist, to hold up this stone above your head. How many of you have been to Berea or Amherst? Berea. Berea. This is Berea Amherst sandstone, so locally sourced in local quarries. How many of you, this is Medina red sandstone. How many of you have been to Medina? Oh, they live Not that Medina, Medina, New York. <laughs> <laughs> the brick is also locally sourced, don't ask me where. Everywhere you see an archway is with seam where these blocks are coming together. Those seams are at the length of their sealant. So as things get moist outside, they get moist down here. We get very humid as we drip down. This is the fan for the bath. <laughs> as you're looking at these blocks, you'll see some white running down and you'll see some uh, tubules, uh, little stalactites. That is salt leaching out of those bricks. So as the bricks get wet, the, the water flows through, it grabs a little bit of salt and minerals and it leaches it out to the outside of the brick. That takes centuries, we're 128 years old, so it makes sense. So we've got salt out of all of these seams. You'll particularly see it where the mortar is because the mortar uses a whole lot more salt. The stone above your head, the, the sandstone, is eight and a half to 10 inches thick. It is what you're walking on when you go around the statues on the outside, nothing in between. So it gets awfully cold at times, or it gets awfully hot at times. When it's hot, it's humid down here. When it's cold, it's like a cold glass of water, and the condensation grabs onto it, so that's where we get all these water droplets to see about it. If we get humid enough, which we used to when we had our steam running, if we get humid enough, you can actually get a little bit of rain down here. All right, we're gonna do, this, do the same thing. We're gonna go through there to the left, follow that curve around, to your left again, and into the next room, opposite this one. As you pass by, you'll see a picture of the monument without the decking. So you can see before the decking went in what these tunnels look like from above. So in this room, 
wanted to bring up this ladder at the end. I talked about the 50s a lot. So in the 50s, they did a lot of work on the monument. They built the, uh, the um, stairway outside. They cut that hole in. Has the, put the railings in the stairway outside. They built the uh, stairs that you're going to be going up to get into the memorial room. And before those stairs were there were, was that ladder. I don't think we want to touch it. Yeah. Unless you're up on your tetanus shots. We don't want to touch it. And that's exactly what it's doing. Um, it's a stairway to nowhere now. But that used to be the way that you got from the memorial room down into the tunnels. Uh, now we have a nice staircase, which is extremely narrow, and you'll enjoy going up there. Uh, the other side of this wall, so we talked about these are holding up our statues. That wall is the exterior wall of the uh, memorial room. On the other side of the memorial room are barrel vaults. There's, we're in what's called the outer tunnels, and the interior tunnels, the inside tunnels are what are on the other side there. They're barrel, they're Roman style barrel vaults, so they're made of brick. They create these big curved archways that go one to the next, so they push against each other all the way out to the thick outer walls. In the middle is the shaft. The shaft goes from a column above the, the roof. Once it hits the roof, it turns into a square. That square is what's in the middle of the uh, memorial room, and you'll see statuary around the outside of that column. And then it goes down into the basement area where it flares out like a pyramid at the bottom and goes even deeper than we know. Uh, so we're not sure exactly how deep it goes, but it's deep. Uh, it is holding that shaft and all of that immense amount of pressure above the building. So that's what the interior uh, tunnels look like. We don't take people through there because while these nice large doorways are cut for these, those are really small. You'll see one of those, you'll see the only entrance to that, those tunnels. Um, when you go up those steps, there to the left, as you're getting ready to go up the steps, you will welcome to take a peek in there and see what they look down. Yeah. Do you have, or is there an architectural drawing of the layout of this? Yes, so I, there is, but I can explain it to you as well. So we're on the artillery, we're at the infantry statue at this point. So this is the long side of the infantry statue. This is where our doorway is in the north side of the building. And then that's the memorial room. As we're walking around that curve, that curve are the staircases that go down from the outside, uh, on the outside. And then you run into the end of the statue. Then you came through this door to go around the statue. We'll go around that side, that's the other end of the statue. And then we'll hit another curve to go through, and that's another set of stairs. So as you go around, there are two sides to the tunnel. There's this inner side and the outer side of these, ex of these outer tunnels. We're gonna, we don't usually show that on the tour. So if anybody's been on the tour in the past, we don't usually show it. But this year, we're going to show you the other side of this one on our way back. So we're going to go one more chamber down. So we're going to do the same do -si do We'll go here, we'll make a left. We'll go down that curved wall, make another left, and you'll go into the next chamber.
Sorry. So this is as deep into the tunnels as we'll go. We've made it all the way around. We've seen all of the statues from the bottom. And the only thing left is one more of those curved hallways around this, this side. But then you run into a smack into a brick wall where the other side is the rat hole. So you run into that brick wall. So while it would be hilarious for me to try to wall down that hole, we won't do that. Um, in this area, we like to talk about these events that we've been seeing on our side. There's these little cutout half moons on either side and each of the tunnels. Those are for ventilation, and we use them for pass-through. Uh, we pass through all kinds of things from electrical and sewer lines to uh, shovels and anything else that needs to be stored this far back into the tunnel. Uh, they were bigger at one point. You can see where this one was shrunk a bit. Uh, that's because they started passing people through at one point. This is a liability issue. So they stopped that and they made them a little bit smaller so that they're just uh, The building itself was electrified from the beginning. So we have these electric lights down here. But in this tunnel is the best place you can see the hooks for what would have been the, the old lights. They're lanterns of some sort. You can see some hooks here, and there's some, a lot that you can see down in the corner there. So if you'd like to see some rusty hooks, you can come down this way and find those. They uh, were not sure if they were for a gas lantern or electric lantern. We were electrified from the beginning. Uh, 1890s electric light it is new. Uh, new to the point where they didn't trust it, but they put it in as electric heating in this building. So all of our floor, all of our Vent, all of our heat ducts upstairs were electric baseboard heaters. Uh, they soon turned over to uh, steam, and we've been on steam until this year, and we're changing over to a boiler system uh, over the summer. That project actually starts tomorrow, where they'll be bringing in a whole new electrical line. Um, so that'll be interesting. But the, uh, the lanterns down here may have been gas. We don't, we don't currently have a gas line, so we don't know where a gas line would have been, and, or they could have been electric, which is something that they had adopted from the beginning. Um, my guess would be electric. Um, the, that is, their mistrust of that electricity, however, is shown in the gasoliers. So there was gas at some point, and they put in, we have replicas of chandeliers upstairs that were gasoliers. Gas on the top, electric on the bottom. So if anybody's an electrician and wants to try that out at home, let me know. Um, but when in the early days of electricity, it wasn't very trusted. So it was a lot. That may be why they changed over from electric heat. But with the gasoliers, you always had that gas backup, which is an unknown standard. Um, so this is what we're going to do from here. We're going to head back the way we came. So the front can come to the back. You're going to follow those exit signs. It says exit to the left. Once you go into that next chamber, that's where you want to stop. So you'll see pictures in there. We want to stop there. This is pretty cool walking through these tunnels. So right now on the way back, we're going through the exit. Yeah, she's with Daddy. She's a. 
All right. So if you've ever been on this tour before, you would have never been down this tunnel. This is the first time we're opening it up. These are the outer tunnels. So you've seen me pop up in new places all the time. It's because I ran down the other tunnels that match this one. Those two other tunnels, though, have our new air conditioning system. In 2009, we did a major renovation. We put air conditioning into the monument. Before that, the only thing we could do is open up the doors and windows and let it in the air. Uh, I said that in the 50s, they did uh, some things that were good. They did some things not so good. One of the things they did that was not so good was when uh, they came in and they decided they needed to clean the walls. This is an industrial city. We were built on the backs of uh, the steel mills. It was grimy. Uh, the city traffic around us, when we open up those windows, all of that dirt and grime comes in over a generation and it was it really caked onto the walls. So they decided they wanted to clean the memorial room walls. Well, they did that with an astringent, not, either not realizing or not realizing that it was going to affect the faux painting that was on the walls, and they stripped out all the color. That entire room is made of white Carrera marble, including the ceiling. All of it, painted with faux paint with uh, you know faux painted to look like other naturally occurring marbles they had in 2009 a major renovation when we put in those air conditioners they also went in and they had the art museum and natural history museum come in and test at a molecular level the different pigments that were inside those uh, inside the marble the marble was a little bit coarse so it, it sucked up a little bit of color they were able to identify those colors and have them painted back in. That includes the names on the walls. The 9,000 names as you go upstairs all had to be painted back in. They thought they could do that with a process where you squeegee on the paint and then squeegee it off the surface. But as I said, it's a little coarse. That didn't work. So they had to go in and hand paint every single letter. Not only every single letter, but all of the design around all of those names. If you look at the uh, there's, uh, there's drums, and then there's uh, packs. If you look at the pack, the backpack, some of those lines are so tiny that the artist had to go in with a single aardvark hair to paint in those lines. It took 18 months. It was the artist's daughter, who's the artist who did the rest of the faux painting and put in all the, the, the veining of the marbles and whatnot. She came in for 18 months, six hours a day, and just painted for a she said it was a little nice. Um, so the reason I wanted to bring you into this tunnel is to see this wall over here. So if everybody wants to take a step this way and take a look back at this wall, you'll see divots throughout the entire wall. So when we think about construction today, we think about the Sherwin Williams building and the, the uh, cranes that they used over there. They used those big metal cranes here. They would have had uh, lock and tackle rigging on wood frame structures and use force and manpower in order to lift these blocks into place. They did that with two cal with calibers that would grab onto the sides and be able to, to reposition those blocks. If you just grab onto a side of sand onto a slab of sandstone, you'll rip right through it. So they had to put in handholds. The divots that you see are the handholds that they would drill in to be able to grab with those calibers. They're throughout the tunnel, so as you go, you'll be able to see those on other places but this is the, uh, the wall that has the most of those divots. Next to those divots, you'll see some channels cut in where it looks like a half pipe. That little bit of, that is half of a drill hole. So to quarry these stones, they would drill down, then they would, they would put in wedges, and the wedges would split that stone into blocks. And that's how those were created. Um, this building has stayed in perfect precision for 128 years. And I can say it hasn't moved a centimeter, and I know that because of our doors upstairs. We have 800 pound bronze doors on either end of the memorial room. They are able to be moved with two fingers. The smallest of us in here could definitely do it. That little lady at the end might be able to do it. Uh, they are held in with a pin at the top and a pin at the bottom, and they have zero clearance. So when you go up there, you'll see there's less than a quarter of an inch at the top, less than a quarter of an inch at the bottom, solid stone on either side. They slide perfect. Uh, never been reset in the history of the monument. Uh, that includes, in 1982, when the Cuyahoga building, which was right across 
the street over here. Currently the home of the Huntington Building was imploded. Um, also, that includes the construction of Terminal Tower, which dug down several stories to put in the trains that continue to rumble past us every day. Uh, those vibrations have never affected this building. It was built like a fortress by the men in that picture at the front. Uh, they're the, the, one, the first picture you saw as you came in, those stonemasons did a phenomenal job. So I hope that everybody's had a good time. If anybody has any questions, the last time we'll be together as a group. Uh, anybody have any questions? All right, we're going to head out that door. We'll follow the arrows all the way down. You'll follow the last arrow to the right. You'll go through the tunnels and the, the metal stairs around the right hand side. I'll try and jump ahead here. Uh, I think they said earlier, this is the only monument you'll see with Abraham Lincoln holding a gun as he's handing it to, uh, I believe they said the first African American depicted in such a statue. And they really emphasized that this was, uh, this whole monument, everything associated with it was about the Civil War and freeing slaves. artifacts like Civil War sharpshooter eyeglasses, 16 pound piece of shrapnel, well remnants of it, message pouch, a 
flask, forge cap. Alright, so let's... Just like that, we're back outside now. So that was a fun tour to see the uh, underground tunnels. I'm not sure how well the footage is going to show up on my video because it may have been too dark under there. But hopefully, you can see enough of it, and hopefully, the audio of the guy's uh, speech came out well enough as the clouds are starting to get a little bit darker out here. Wonder if the rain forecast is still in the air. But if you enjoyed this video of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument and a tour of the tunnels, feel free to hit the like button, give us a subscribe, leave a comment down below, and we will see you next time.